My name is Mal Malmi, and I've lived in Central Square in Cambridge since 2002. And I live with my wonderful spouse, Meg, and we were couple number 147 at Cambridge City Hall on May 16th, 11 p.m., when City Hall opened in 2004. And uh, we've signed uh, our application for a marriage license at 3.15 in the morning and I think what pride means to me is that we are part of history that I have an understanding of history of the movement that I know that I can claim who I am and claim my truth because of those who came before me and that with that intention that I can be part of the movement moving forward ensuring that everybody is included inequality and remembering that we all have responsibility and we all have incredible heart when it comes to being part of what's going to happen in the future. And I'm so honored to be living in Cambridge and part of a city that is progressive and inclusive and frankly just awesome. Hi, I'm Jeff Walker. I live here in Cambridge. I have for the past 25 years. I'm a single gay dad raising two beautiful daughters here in this great city. Um, I worked for the city for many years in public health, designing programs to um, help people stay healthy. I then worked in the mayor's office as her chief of staff and um, am now doing some part-time work in the mayor's office. Um, I I love this city. It's um, you know, full of very strong, powerful people doing really great stuff on the cutting edge, really trying to make a difference, not just in this city for the people who live here, but as a role model for how cities should be in the world. And especially around GLBT issues, um, I was a founding member of the Cambridge GLBT Commission, and that's simply because the city cared enough to, um, to build that into its infrastructure and decide that it was important. We were the first in gay marriage. We um, <clears throat> are just really a great city, and so I'm very proud to be a part of that. I'm proud to be a dad. I'm proud to be an out man. And I'm very proud of the city that I live in. My name is Kim Topping. I'm a youth worker and LGBTQ rights activist in Cambridge. To me, pride is really about community. It's about coming together across all of our generations and celebrating our history and the work that we've done and the work that we continue to do around the injustices that are happening for LGBTQ people. To me, pride is really about strength and love and coming together. Hi, I'm Reverend Irene Monroe, and um, I, re I have resided in the People's Republic of Cambridge since uh, 1994 or 93. I can't even remember now. So what does pride mean to me? Well. Pride is about the varied expressions of the life, gifts, and talents of the entire LGBT community. At its core, Pride events are an invitation for community. They should highlight the multicultural aspect of joy and celebration that symbolizes not only our uniqueness as individuals and communities, but also affirm our varied expressions of LGBTQ life in America. While Pride events are still fraught with divisions along race, class, and gender identity lines, they are nonetheless, they bind us to a common struggle of LGBT equality. And our diversity not only affirms our uniqueness as LGBT people, but it also broadens America's understanding that democratic society is really a diverse one. But as long as the LGBT communities and cultures of color continue to be absent each June, Pride Month is an event not to be proud of. In the face of our own self-respect, um, who gather at, at this breakfast, at Cambridge breakfast each year, old and young, I, I want to offer you this, the Kwanzaa principle of unity. 
And it must take root in our self-understanding of who we are and what we decide to be as a community and as an ongoing movement, especially in the People's Republic of Cambridge. And understanding the interconnectedness between himself as the individual and himself as the community, African historian John Ubuntu said this, I am because we are, and since we are, therefore I am. So in the face of our own self-respect and embracing the quantum principle of Ujima, the competition among us must stop. The distrust among us must stop. The bigotry, the single-mindedness of LGBT issues, and yes, the unchecked white privilege must stop. Why? Other than the fact that many of us are just too damn old to repeat the same mistakes that we did in our youth, and we must leave a legacy for younger generations to follow, Cambridge really is a beacon on the hill. And we must remember that the whole world continues to watch Massachusetts in terms of LGBT justice. And for many of us, LGBT justice for all is our calling, our life's work, and our ministry. So I close on this note for the LGBTQ People's Republic of Cambridge. For you all to ponder, united we can stand as a prophetic community, or divided we will fall as a petty people. Happy Pride. I'm Estelle Dish, I'm 73. I've lived in Cambridge in my current location for about 30 years. I've been on and off in the city since the 70s. There are two things that I think about when I think about Pride. One is safety, and the other is being seen. I have felt safe in Cambridge. I came out in the late 70s in the midst of the women's movement with lesbians everywhere, happy cultural events. It was just an amazing moment. And the city was okay with that. The city was cool with that. Then on the feeling seen end, the city has pride events. There's, there's for decades been lesbian and gay counselors. Um, I remember one of the happiest events of my whole life was standing outside City Hall the night that I think it was Denise Simmons had the idea to open the offices for same-sex marriage registration at midnight. It was the best party I've ever attended. Um, so I feel very seen by the city, by both the events and by the people. And every now and then, of course, somebody doesn't care about my so-called lifestyle, but uh, they don't bother me. They don't, I don't feel threatened by it. So I think this is a great place to live, and I'm very happy to be here. And today, I wanted us to focus on a very important matter that, um, uh, if properly understood, can resolve a lot of conflicts. There's a lot of discussion today about so-called hate speech. But this term, actually, linguistically, is inappropriate because hate refers to emotions, whereas speech refers to reason, logos. So there's interaction between emotions and logos. Um, the uh, history of political philosophy is rich in books who discuss those topics. And somehow today, this very important distinction between emotions and logos, logic, reason, has been lost. And many people have been trying to apply matters of 
emotions onto the language, the logos that expresses reason. And you cannot discuss the conflict if you apply emotions to what is logical reasoning or vice versa when you apply logical reasoning logos to emotions i have this uh, word here in french amour and that means love and when i um, use the word love as logos a realm it is just a word identifying a particular emotion linguistically when i feel love in my heart or you feel love in your hearts that refers to emotion that resides within the faculty of our life which is called so emotions so i believe that emotions also um, are in our mind because god says love um, love god with all your heart with all your mind and all your soul so uh, the matters of love emotions refer to our hearts our souls and our minds and as many of you know the soul resides in the spirit and that is life spirit is spirit of life so when we are looking today at conversations around social media we see that there is lack of understanding about those two aspects of expression emotional and linguistic emotional referring to emotions that reside within us and linguistic to logical explanations descriptions uh, reference and all of those amazing things that we find in dictionaries and great literature uh, i wanted us to focus on the word pathos and here uh, we have in um, wikipedia that i encourage you to support it's an amazing um, resource for knowledge amazing group of people running it and here we have definition of pathos um, it is from greek pathea pathos for suffering pathetic for but uh, appeals to the emotions of the audience and elicits feelings that already reside in them so we have a situation that we understand that the sender has emotions and the audience has emotions and if the sender the orator the producer the speaker talks to the audience emotionally and the members of the audience don't have certain particular emotions re already residing in them there is disconnect and when we talk about logos it's sufficient to speak the language and have ability to reason and um, the um, faculty of language is part of natural law of human life so everybody can understand uh, language within the own um, families mother tongue and then we learn other languages and can communicate internationally so here is a very important difference that we have to understand because if a speaker talks to members of the audience about something and those people uh, can understand what he says but the speaker 
uh, really does want to appeal to the reason and explain things and reason things, but wants to appeal to the emotions. But if a particular emotion is not there, nothing will happen. And then the speaker gets furious and wants to be in the audience. And that is inappropriate. The appropriate way then would be to figure out ways to have audience receive certain uh, emotions so that they can connect with the emotion that a particular speaker wants to connect to. And this is not easy. As uh, those of you who understand art, great literature, great um, biblical teachings know that it is not easy to have emotional wealth within us uh, without some effort. And that's part of the educational process to shape and impart those emotions. So I propose that in social media, we will not ban people for saying something that one group disagrees with, but that we will create ways to uh, help people understand reasoning as uh, the proper response to disagreement. And for emotional aspects of interaction, we have to understand that if someone uh, in the audience doesn't have emotion of love residing in him and or her, there's nothing you can do to force your love on that person on that or that group of people. It, it won't happen because they don't have that emotion within them. But what you can do is figure out ways to impart that spirit of love in them or spirit of other positive emotions so that they receive those emotions in their lives and then you can interact uh, emotionally within uh, each other and there is a connection and understanding. So the activity of banning is exactly what shouldn't be done in such situation because then there is no hope of ever um, having connection to that person again even if after some other situations in uh, their lives they actually have that emotion residing in them so i think that we have to become very sophisticated in the uh, in the way that we develop um, global conversations on social media social media and internet are great gifts from spirit of god and this is an opportunity that former generations didn't have because we can develop opportunities of communication and interaction and peace uh, that um, former generations didn't even dream about so we have the technology and now we have to have knowledge of how to create all social media as marketplace of ideas, interactions and learning, both in all aspects of pathos, that is emotional connection and logos, reason. Uh, let's look um, uh, at the Uh, further part of this amazing article and I encourage you to read the whole article it's really huge uh, so pathos is a communication technique used most often in rhetoric in which it is considered one of the three modes of persuasion alongside ethos and logos as well as in literature film and other narrative art so we have to understand that pathos um, is 
also a technique used in communication that is a form of persuasion. So once there is connection between the speaker and the audience in a particular emotional way, then the next step is how to persuade the audience about the particular point of view. So then we have that point of contact between emotions and reason. So emotions in this context can be used as a ground to help the mind, the reason, logos, change mind uh, and, and change opinions on certain things. For instance, um, when a person uh, has fear of teachers and then one day that person meets a good teacher and the teacher persuades that um, individual that learning in the context of a school is a wonderful experience. So in this particular connection, the teacher can help the reason of a person to overcome negative emotions around teacher-student interaction and go beyond that bad feeling to higher feelings, to um, feelings that uh, uh, create pathos of interaction, um, higher level of interaction with emotions uh, of other people in the context of communication than just um, fear or lack of um, desire to connect with something good just because of some past bad experience or um, uh, lack of emotion that would help the logos to connect with something desirable, good, and wonderful. So when you look at history here, I'll just show you a little bit. Um, there is um, a lot of uh, talk about pathos in ancient literature, Aristotle, um, other Hellenistic philosophers, of course, there is the entire um, situation with um, biblical teachings about emotions. Then the interaction of emotion is expanded to include kingdom of God, divine um, speaker who has capacity to impart right emotions to the audience and then the audience can connect with the divine in ways that are elevating and that also expands ca capabilities of reason to grasp um, the uh, realities of life here and in kingdom of God. There's a very famous philosopher, Thomas Aquinas, that um, is one of the um, few people who Roman Catholic Church um, considers doctors of the church and his name is Thomas Aquinas and he wrote many books many amazing books that I encourage you to read a lot a lot of them are now online on YouTube you can access them easily and Thomas Aquinas at some point in his life had vision of kingdom of God and God um, logos and after this he couldn't write anything because he thought that uh, whatever his capabilities were at that time couldn't express the multidimensionality of that understanding and uh, he just wrote, uh, wrote that everything that he had written before was just straw and never wrote anything afterwards but became a silent and quiet inspiration for people um, uh, 
in his times he he inspired me to do um, many amazing things intellectually and he gave me this understanding that in order to connect our emotions to the highest level of logos god himself we have to have capability within us to connect with him emotionally and intellectually so in closing i wanted us to know about importance not only of free speech but also in ways to connect to free speech and to understand the nature of such connections and i think that that energy that has been used to be in people should be used to learn how to connect people i will repeat it again let's learn how to connect people in emotions in reason and let's stop banning people because banning is a form of violence we don't see it that way but it is and that should be used as a total last resort in some situations that are very difficult to resolve in other ways but routinely we should focus on improving better ways to beautifully connect people through heart-to-heart -heart communication, through conversation,